Christian Dold, welcome to the show, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have an in-person interview these days. It's a little bit rare. And it is, yeah. I was just saying before we got rolling how much more you can kind of dive in and connect over the, not as much over the phone as in person for sure. So is, there's there's a huge disconnect when, when you're not in person. I don't know what it is, but it's just like, you know how there's like a like nine, 10 millisecond lag between when you're on, you know, audio video yep. versus like being in person. It's just, there's something weird about it. Yeah, I don't man. know what it is. We're going to be firing today. I can already feel it. I got uh, a bunch of stuff to ask you about. Super interested in your journey and your path and uh, just like start, let's just start kind of in the background of how you grew up, like what you were interested in as a kid. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. So what was life like as a kid for you? Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up around here, obviously. Um, I grew up in like Bellevue, just like not too far away. Um, and I, you know, as a kid, I was, I did the normal kid things that you do around here. You know, I played soccer, did that kind of stuff. Grew up playing piano. Um, Me too. Nice. How, how old Hated were you when it. you started? I, I was the same way. My aunt was a piano teacher. My mom made me take lessons and like, I would work so freaking hard. And then I'd learn one song and she'd give me like a Johann Sebastian Bach, like yeah. a little statue. And that was supposed to be my reward for the, <laughs> for learning piano. That's such a piano it's teacher thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like my piano teachers would all do the same shit. Like they would just have like some weird reward that like yeah. just is meaningless. Yeah. That's so funny. But yeah, I, I was the same way. I hated playing piano growing up, like absolutely hated it. And it was actually like a huge uh, argument point. Just um, um, my whole family like would just argue about it because my mom really wanted me to play. And uh, my dad didn't care if I played or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just did not want to. I didn't practice. I didn't learn how to sight read anything. But I ended up playing for like 12 or 13 years. And I hated it literally the whole time. And Oof. finally, when I was like 14 or 15, my mom's like, all right, you can just quit if you don't like it. And I was like, all right, I'm out. Wow. Um, but I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, obviously it really like fostered my love for music and like it, it gave me an ear that I wouldn't have otherwise, you know. But it's like almost a bit hard for me to imagine like you love music, but at the same time you didn't like piano. So did you know that there was like another path in this for you and yeah uh and i my piano teacher was really cool too and he was like he introduced me to like a lot of the music that i listen to now like he would show me like like seattle bands like death cat for cutie and like this like weird icelandic band seeger rose who i got really into and like and he would like take me to all the concerts too when they were like in town um and he would he would let me play like any song that i wanted on piano so i'd bring him like Coldplay stuff or like just anything that i was into you know and like uh, he would he would basically teach me how to play it on piano and even still I was just like a little shit kid I was like nah I still don't like piano that's funny but uh but yeah I mean it it was one of those things where it gave me the foundation to you know kind of like branch out on my own and, and figure out what I like um even if it wasn't piano and I I like playing piano it's still even though I played it for the longest it's definitely not my best instrument but mm -hmm. um it got me really interested in guitar and uh just kind of like wanting to like make my own music in general you know i very cool i think i just didn't like playing other people's songs as much as i did because I would, I would sit down and you know even when i was beginning piano I'd, i would just hit random notes and find stuff that sounded cool much rather than like sight reading piano you know mm -hmm. sight reading to me it just felt like i was doing math homework yeah it's like memorization almost yeah. like literally you're not learning necessarily and you're just memorizing the way to move your fingers That's exactly like how yeah. i remember it at least at yeah. my low level and i i refuse to uh i refuse to sight read actually so much that my piano teacher was finally like fuck it i'm just gonna teach you by like rote so i was literally just memorizing keys you know yeah. I, and it was I, it wasn't, it didn't feel musical to me, you know? Dude, that's, that's interesting. So walk me from growing up like piano to like, I guess the first thing I'd ask is like, when did you see that there was a professional path for you in the music industry? Um, I think, well, it, it was weird because growing up, you know, I, I really wanted to be in a band. Like I loved the idea of like romantically of just like being in a band and like mm -hmm. performing in front of a bunch of people. So that was like, I, I always knew that I would do something professionally in music, you know, and I always wanted to be like in front of people performing, even though that's obviously not what ended up happening. But I always wanted that to be my career path in some way or another. Um, but, you know, I started playing in bands in like middle school and I would try to form bands with my friends, but no one would take it nearly as serious as I would. No one was like devoted to it. Hmm. And like I was like ready to throw my whole life <laughs> away for to be in a band, you know, and like yeah. no one was. I couldn't find anyone that had like the same level of commitment as me. And, uh, 
And I was, I was playing drums, guitar, bass. I could pretty much play any instrument. So I was just like, you know, like asking people I know, like, what do you, what do you want me to do? I'll join your band, blah, blah, blah. Nice. But like nothing ever like really came to fruition. Um, but, uh, I think it was probably ninth or 10th grade, um, when my parents got divorced and, uh, I moved into an apartment in Isqual with my dad and I had to basically just like sell my drum set. Oh, I could keep no. my guitar, but it was like, I, you know, I, I couldn't play it loud. Like I used to, like we grew up in this big house where I could just jam out all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, and like then moving to an apartment, there was nothing that I could really do. Um, and that was like around the same time that I discovered music production and I got really into like electronic music and I was like, Oh, these guys just make this on a laptop and like mm -hmm. headphones. Yeah. Like I was going to ask you, cause when you were a kid, when we were kids, like that wasn't really a thing that was as popular as like actually producing music on a laptop. Yeah, no, not really. I think it was like, I kind of caught it at the right time because yeah. you know, it was around the time that electronic music was becoming popular and it was around the time that laptops were like capable enough to where you could have everything just completely in the box, you know? Mm -hmm. And and uh, so for me, that was like game changer. Was like GarageBand number one, like the number one? Uh, I mean, GarageBand, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's like what I started making stuff on uh -huh. when I got my first Mac in like seventh grade. But I didn't, I didn't really know that you could just make it all in the box. You know, at the time I was like, oh, well, I need all this expensive recording software and, uh, you know, all this hardware to basically just rec like record a guitar. You know, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was like a way that you can just make everything inside a computer. Um, and uh, around ninth or 10th grade, I, I kind of discovered that you can just make like a whole song without any external instruments or recording anything. Who knew, man? Um, and yeah, so that was kind of the yeah. time that that uh, became really interesting to me. And like, you know, I had friends in high school who were like aspiring rappers and like needed beats and stuff. So I would just try making beats and stuff just on my computer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that got really fun for me. Um, I was in a... Uh, I did like a little DJ duo group with my friend in high school and we just played like shows locally. That was pretty fun. Like high school parties and like, little yeah, we, we, we DJ like, like the high school dances nice. and like we played, uh, have you ever been to ground zero in Bellevue next to the mall? It's no, like this no. like shitty teen center that, uh, <laughs> like just bands that were in high Kinda school. Like, what's would it called? Play. K club. What was that thing? Called? K tub. K uh, yeah. We played there too. K yeah. Town. Oh, K Town. You know oh, what I'm talking the about? The dance place? The dance place up in Kirkland or whatever. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. It's different than that place. Ratchet dance it's, place. I've been there and that was ratchet. That, that was a weird part of middle school. Do those things still exist? Dude, I used or to high go, school. We used to go to these like these Benzikob, like Jewish dances, and it was like the most fun thing. Everyone's dead sober and you're just having such a good time, like at these basically like parties for like 13 and 14 yeah. year olds. Yeah. That's funny. Did yeah. you, you, you went to K-Town though? A couple times, a couple times. I went there once and I was like, what the fuck is this? Cause it's basically yeah. like a club for like, yeah, like underage kids. How did they even get away with that? I don't even know. I have no <laughs> idea. That's why I was asking if it's still a thing. Cause they have it's had to be shut, shut down. down by now. Yeah. Yeah. Super weird. That's super funny though. But, uh, but yeah, anyways, um, I just kind of did production just as a hobby, like in high school mm -hmm. and, um, I went off to college. It was the same kind of thing. And by college, I had started my uh, solo project, which is Diamond Pistols. Mm -hmm. And uh, I signed a record deal when I was 18 um, and just kind of started putting music out. Um, still just kind of, I was like making, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month off of maybe like nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and just like enough to like buy beer still in college. Still nice in college. Yeah. 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 yeah it's something um, better than and, like uh, working at the convenience store. Or totally. Yeah. 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 But it was nothing I, I ever took really seriously. You yeah. know, I didn't think it was like my career at the time. I was like mm -hmm. a student. Um, but I would, I would play, I think the first, I played like an out of state show when I was like 18, they flew me out to Denver and they paid me like a thousand bucks or something, which at the time I was like, Oh my God, I am rich, <laughs> <laughs> which is hilarious to think about. But yeah, I can relate on my first like big photography project yeah. over a thousand bucks. Like, wow. Yeah. This is crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, re I remember they like, they offered me a thousand bucks and I was like, you guys don't have to pay me that much. Like I'll just do it for like literally like a couple hundred bucks. Like, uh -huh. but they paid me a thousand bucks and it was cool. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, I just started playing like little shows like that. Um, kind of, you know, just, in cities like Denver or Sacramento, just little like, random little cities that had these just little underground electronic music scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you know, I kind of just like putted my way through college, graduated and, um, never really like grew, um, my artist project to the point where it was like, you know, a full-time touring business, which is like where I wanted to be when I graduated. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I, so I studied finance and I, I was working, um, at a place in Spokane, um, doing finance at the time. And 
the, the time came where it was like, all right, I, I'm graduating. Like, what do I do now? And my mom basically sat me down and was like, you need to like pursue this. Like, I know that you're not like fully like, you know, invested right now because mm-hmm. like I, I was like at the time I was just like, you know, I need something that's like going to make me money because I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do with this. Right. And my mom was like I the most supportive parents ever, like Dude, of that's all time. Awesome. And it's amazing because yeah. I feel like so many people don't have that, especially in music. Say, yeah, especially in the Bellevue Mercer Island area, like yeah. this outside Seattle area. There's like a clear cut path for a lot of people and you kind of feel a lot of pressure at least the people that I know, like feel pressure to go the finance route or the accounting route or totally. the engineering. Yes. Yeah, so I, pretty I cool. definitely felt that way. Uh-huh. And it wasn't even like a conscious pressure, you know, uh-huh. there wasn't anyone in my life like putting pressure on me, but it was like, you know, yeah. everyone was kind of going to a, like a four year college and getting, you know, a business degree, yeah. going to work for someone like a tech company around here. And it just seemed like kind of what you do. Uh-huh. Um, but my mom was just basically like, uh, just move to LA for like six months. I'll help you out if you need it. Like, and if it doesn't work in six months, just move back. And I was like, okay. And, uh, I moved down to LA and, um, kind of just, I, I kind of still wanted to be a touring DJ and that was kind of what I was focusing on, on at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but just kind of randomly fell into like the production side of things, which is, you know, like helping other artists with, you know, what they want their sound to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of where I've been ever since. And that's, you know, what I've made my career off of now. And like, I don't, I don't DJ really anymore. I DJ like parties for fun sometimes, uh-huh. but you know, production is like my real career now. Nice man. So yeah. when you say your, what do you say your project name or what, what was the term? The artist project. Your artist project. Yeah. It's basically so, like your own company, your record label, your name, your artist. Yeah. Name. So yeah. like I, I think of it like, so my artist project was like me trying to put myself out as an artist and touring off of like the diamond pistols brand, you know, but like, Diamond Pistols now is less of an artist project and more of just like a production project. You got know, you. if that makes sense. Yeah. Got you. How, where did Diamond Pistols come from? Where, how'd you make that name? Um, so I was really into Seattle rap. Um, I don't, I don't even want to say it half because like the, I, I don't want him to like sue me or something, but, uh, I got it from a lyric from this group, Fresh Espresso, who I was like really into in high school, who was like a local Seattle rap group. Um, it was just like a lyric in one of their songs. And I was like, damn, that's sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. just kind of stuck with it. Dude. I love it. Yeah. I, uh, I just started the adventure creator podcast. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, what's the most simple two words that I can put together and try and encompass a little bit of what I'm about. So yeah. kind of the same thing. Yeah, like, it's a great something name. resonates with you. You do it and you don't look back. Have yeah. you ever thought about changing it or anything like that? I have a few times. Um, especially with like, you know, it, it, I've never had any issues with it, but just the association with like guns now and Uh all this shit that's happening with, you know, like gun violence and, you know, the division between like left and right with guns. It's Mm -hmm. like, I, I don't want to be as as associated with it, but it's like Uh now people view it as like, you know, it's me rather than like something visual, you know, you've made it so far, at least so like at this point that you can't really change it. Is that how you feel? Kind of. Uh Yeah. And it's like, it's less about just like, you know, Yeah, it, it's a cool name, yeah. 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 But and another the reason I want to change it is because like people always confuse me. They always think it's two people because it's like plural. Oh yeah, and but it's just me. But it, I don't know. It doesn't no really one fucking needs matter, to know, honestly. Yeah. There's people with way worse names than me out there. Yeah, that yeah. get by fine. So so how do you how would you describe your music taste or your kind of your approach to music? Like, um, my music taste is definitely super eclectic. Like there, I I really love every genre, and I think that's kind of you know, when I, when I originally had my artist project, I, that's kind of where I fell by the wayside because, you know, I would try to make all these different genres and I would never make the same song twice. And Hmm. obviously when you have like a brand that's, you want to be really consistent with what you're putting out and like music wise, I just wasn't consistent with what I was putting out because that's not what I wanted to do. Right. Um, but I think that's what, you know, that's why being a producer works so well for me because, uh, it's the type of career where, you know, I can be in an artist, I can be in the studio with like a rapper, like a street rapper, like Mm -hmm. one night and be in with like a pop star, like the next day, you know, like it's two completely different sides of music, but Mm -hmm. it's like, it's something that I like doing. It's it's just not working with the same type of music twice in a row. You know, it's just, I like doing like having, you know, my hand in every, every different basket, you know, makes a lot of sense. I think something that I've seen in writers, artists, photographers, like, you build a bit of a brand or a following. You have fans that like you for the certain type of music. Like you see this, I don't know many good examples because I don't know the music industry that well. It's but every artist, I, they, I know exactly. They what do you're that. About, they yeah. produce an album. It's like it, people just eat it up. They love it, and then they want to change because they grow as a person and they don't want to do the same music because there's something fulfilling about 
progressing as an artist, right? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a really hard line to tread because uh-huh. it's like, you know, you want to keep the fans happy, but you don't want to make the same record twice. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's really hard to please everyone. As like an Kid Cudi is a good example of that for me. Mm-hmm. Like he made that Man on the Moon album and just yeah. went crazy. And then the next album, people are hating on it. What was the album after that one? I don't know, man. I'm not, I don't know. But yeah, kinda, I mean, well, also Man on the Moon was just such a like iconic album. That, for sure. That, that there's a million artists that are like that though. Uh-huh. It's literally like the curse of being in the music industry. It's is like you produce something big, it hits, and then it's hard to kind of replicate that. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Have you had something like that, like a big song, or not really? Because I mean, as a as a producer, you know, I've I've had songs that have been big, and I have you know, I have a gold record now, and I have a Billboard number one. But it's like as a producer, you're kind of always on to the next thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's not you're not really stuck in. You know, it's more as an artist, you're kind of like, oh, how do I replicate this one hit? But as mm-hmm. a producer, it's just like, oh, I'm just gonna work with this next artist who's now about to pop, you know, it's just always trying to find that like next artist to work with really. How did you, I want to hear a little bit about like that six month or that first step to LA. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like how did you get your foot in the door? How did you start to network? Kind of like get your, get your feet wet. Yeah. Well, I got kind of lucky with, you know, I mean, obviously with the internet, that's the best way to meet everyone now. And like I, when I went to college, I was in Spokane, Washington and I was, you know, making music, (sighs) Spokane for sure. (laughs) Um, and I was just making music kind of by myself, isolated out there, um, which I didn't really like at the time, but it kind of forced me to connect with as many people as I could, you know, and I was like sending my music to like literally everyone and, and just trying to network over the internet, over Twitter. And, you know, I don't even think we really used Instagram like that at that time, but it was Mm -hmm. mostly like Twitter, Facebook, a lot of, a lot of electronic music producers back in the day had, uh, AOL instant messenger that we were the last (laughs) ones on Throwback, Yeah. And so I would literally, I would type like pretty much every producer had it. And Uh so I would, I would go on and I would just guess these people's names. Like I would just try to guess their like screen name. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I got my, my first record deal. I, uh, I like guessed this guy's screen name and sent him music. And then he messaged me back like five months later and was like, uh, hey, these are awesome. I want to sign these. And I was like, what? Whoa. I, I like, it's, it's literally like on almost hard to believe. That's you know? like some hardcore, like almost uh, just like guerrilla warfare style, yeah. you know, just getting in the trenches. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, it, the thing is like nowadays, so many people do that, especially with Instagram and stuff that it's really hard to, you know, it's, it's hard to get noticed like that. But I think back in the day there, you know, people had more bandwidth to respond to people, but you, you go on, mm-hmm. on any Instagram post it's popular now. And like the first comments, I was like 16 year old rapper. Like, what do you think of my music? Is uh-huh. it good? Uh-huh. And like, so it's just, it's so hard to cut through the noise now. I don't even know what the best solution for that is now, but interesting. So you don't have to deal with that. Like first entry level of trying to like meet someone like you already are established in your career and now like yeah you're meeting people through word of mouth like exactly people introducing so, you yeah. yeah and by the time i moved to la uh i got i got really lucky the the first guy i moved with in la was uh, a friend of mine who i had met um at that first show that i played when i was 18 in denver and he was uh, a really uh established producer and so i moved in with him and uh kind of just started like networking in person with these people that i had like known online more or less over the past few years mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. And, you know, I just, you know, it's LA is really the type of place where if you show up, you'll meet people and make connections. And it's like, it gets a lot of shit because it's kind of like, it's a big party place, you know, but it's like, those are the places where you like really connect with people. And it's like, and it's more than just like connecting with people to just like use them for, you know, whatever, like Mm -hmm. connections they have or whatever. It's really just about like forming relationships with these people. And then on the off chance that you might work with them, you know? Right. Um, and that's been the majority of my business is just like, you know, meeting people and becoming friends with them and just working with them. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I think a lot of people have like kind of a, a little bit of a negative connotation around this like networking thing. At least like yeah. I was in business school. So teachers are telling you the most important thing that you can do is not get good grades. It's not do well in school. Mm-hmm. It's literally network. Like because one person can be that first job or can open that first door and then boom, a bunch of other doors open. So yeah, I think a lot of people look at it the wrong way though. I, I know I did when I was in business school. Did right. you guys have like the networking events? Yeah, man. I hated those. They're awful. Oh, man. It seems You're so forced. Stand in and, like, line, you go talk to the recruiter and it's, yeah. oh, it's fake. Yeah. To me, like networking the way that I was taught in business school, at least was just like, oh, how can I get this person to give me what I want, you right. know? And like when in reality networking is like, becoming friends with people 
and then you work, you and know, you have it's no like, expectations for success. exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. Give, yeah. Give, That's give, yeah. the only time I've That's ever successfully networked is just like becoming friends with people. Like in my case, sending them my music and maybe they're like, Oh, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. But like, no one's ever going to give you what you want out of them for nothing in return, you know? Yeah. And yeah. you know, if someone, especially if someone's at like a much higher place in life than you, you know? Very well said. That's another thing I noticed. I don't know where I was looking at some of your, uh, LinkedIn, your Instagram and stuff. Um, you talked a little bit about like mentoring younger kids when mm-hmm. you were in college or early in your career. So I guess I would ask you about mentorship in general. How has it been something that's helped you progress? Like how have mentors influenced you? And then how have you, I guess part two would be, how have you benefited from mentoring others yourself? Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I never really had like a, a specifically a music mentor growing up. Um, and I always wished I had, and I, you know, I'm still looking for one, uh, to this day, you know, I've, I've always really wanted to work for like, you know, a really established producer in his fifties and like, you know, mm-hmm. be able to pass on some of my young guy knowledge and like, you yeah. know, show him what's cool in exchange for just like some industry knowledge, you know? Um, but, uh, I've never really had a mentor per se. Hmm. Um, but you know, I, I mentor these two kids now. Um, who uh, I'm, I'm friends with their dad. He's a guy in the music industry and I, they're like a DJ group. Um, Brothers? and I, uh, it's, it's no, they're not related. It's a guy and a girl. Uh-huh. Um, but I mentor them a little bit. Um, but that's pretty much my only experience with mentorship. Nice. Yeah. Hey, there's, there's something to be said about like uh, benefiting from teaching. Right. And like, also it's pretty interesting though, that you don't like really identify any mentors in your life. And yet like, here you are. You I mean, of- I've had, no, I'm, I mean, my dad's my biggest mentor for uh-huh. sure, but n- not in music specifically, but I mean, there's so many d- uh, different people that I could attribute mentorship to, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, my dad's obviously my biggest one. Um, he's just like the coolest guy ever. And like, I just uh, strive to be like him in pretty Dude, much every aspect. I want to meet your parents, man. <laughs> they sound freaking awesome. Yeah. 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 He, he is cool. I mean, I was telling you before the podcast that he just got like a sprinter van and like, he's just been doing that and he's like 70 now. So he's just like, you know, jet setting across the country in the sprinter yeah. van. It's pretty dope. That's awesome. My yeah. dad's a big outdoors guy. And uh, yeah, I've, him and I have butted heads on many things over the years, but the one thing we share is like that passion for the outdoors and yeah. adventure and stuff like that. I really, honestly, I kind of like lost my passion for that when I moved to LA because it's just such a city place. There's, Mm -hmm. there actually, there really is a lot of outdoor stuff. You just have to drive like half an hour or so to get to it. And, you know, it just kind of like escaped my mind. But like being back here has been like, I rekindled my passion for that so much. Like I've been hiking a bunch Uh and like we're going up to Lake Chelan on the lake next weekend. I've been out on the lake on my buddy's boat like every day. Nice. Um, And yeah, we're going ATVing up in Cleella. I'm like just there's so much shit to do up here that's like fun. I've I think I've done that. I've rented ATVs up there or was it snow machines? I think my dad, my brother and I did snow machines. Oh, okay. One time. That's fun. So freaking fun. I've never done it before. Yeah. Oh, dude, you're gonna have a blast. Yeah, it looks really fun. So where I guess this kind of leads me to think about like where you get inspiration because i know it's not easy especially like you're self-employed right you're like mm-hmm. it's it's a one-man show yeah like where when you hit like a roadblock or like you're not feeling inspired like where do you go to to uh kind of like re-energize or just like get get I, focused i think the biggest thing is just understanding that like creativity especially comes in waves and um you know even the most creative people on earth have times where they can't write shit for like a month or two you know and i think it's you know, just understanding that it's not right to force creativity, you know? Um, but there, that being said, there's been times where, you know, I've not felt creative, but as a producer, I have to show up to the studio, you know, I'm not just writing by myself. I can't just like take the day off most of the time. Right. You um, got people to and, count on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's been days where I'm like, you know, I'm like hungover, like I don't really feel like working or I'm like, oh, just lazy. And I show up to the studio and like, I end up making something really dope, just like almost out of necessity, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, I think the thing that keeps me the most creative is knowing that any, any song that I make that day can change my life forever. You know, it's like you go into a session, uh, knowing that you could r- potentially write the biggest song of the century today, you know, Dude, there's that's no crazy you know. thought. Whereas like when you're going into work normally, it's like, okay, there's nothing that I can really do. That's going to change my life normally, mm-hmm. you know? Hmm. Um, but I think that's the thing that keeps me like the most motivated. You talk about changing your life. Where do you 
envision yourself in 10 years or 15, 20 years, like at the prime of your career, where do you see yourself and how do you, how do you see yourself kind of fitting into this uh, industry? Yeah. I don't know. I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot. Not um, that you have to have a clear answer for sure. Like, yeah. I don't have an answer, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot and I think, um, I don't know. It's hard to say because there, you know, there's a lot of producers that are make it well into their forties and fifties and, you know, they still have their edge and they're still able to find like the next sound and what's cool, but there's a lot of people that lose it too. And I think you can't really determine what's going to happen to you and how your brain's going to change. Cause creativity is, it's, it's such a, uh, volatile thing, you know, it's like you have it one day, you don't have it the next. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's really hard to envision like where it's going to be in 10 years. But I think for me, like I've always just been business minded. I don't even think I'm really naturally the most creative person ever. Mm. Um, but, uh, so I, you know, there's been opportunities where I've received like offers for like a joint venture to do a label from like a, like a major label. And I just haven't done it yet because I don't think the timing's right. But like, you know, in 10 years, I think, you know, doing something like running my own record label, um, just doing something other than just music production, you know, there's a million different avenues in music that, hmm. that you can go into business in, you know? Yeah. And I think just like, just diversifying as much as I can. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm like just starting to get a glimpse of is like how how much specialization there is in this industry. Mm -hmm. Like you're a producer, you're kind of in the middle, if you will, of different types of music, different types of artists. And mm -hmm. like, what is it about the music industry? I guess it's kind of similar to film, but I feel like way more so like film. You've got your DP, you've got your director, yeah. you've got your editor or whatever. The crew can grow. Yeah. But like, why is why is music just so specialized? Um, Because I think there's a lot of things in a film that you can point to that are like, this is what makes a good film. You know, music, it's kind of enigmatic. Like there's yeah. not really a certain, no one knows the formula to write a hit song. That's there's a I'm lot saying. of people yeah. that's, that think they do. And that would be discouraging for me. Yeah. Like, uh, well, it's discouraging, but also it's exciting because uh -huh. you never know what's going to work. You know, it's because like you can send your, your song to someone and they can be like, oh, the song fucking sucks. But you can be like, nah, they're probably going to be wrong. And then someday I'm going to be telling this story about how they were wrong. And I was right because the song blew up, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, is that a gut feeling thing or is that like a, uh, it's definitely a gut feeling thing. Uh -huh. Like no one ever agrees on songs. Like, are, are you familiar with like what an A&R does? Uh, no. So A&Rs work at record labels and it's basically their job to decide what songs are good and what songs are bad mm -hmm. and what needs changing. Um, and it's just the most bullshit job ever because it's just yeah. most of the time it's people that were failed musicians <laughs> that want to be A&Rs. Um, kind of like film critics. Yeah, exactly. Know? Like yeah. make a film. It's <laughs> Exactly. And, uh, and they're basically in charge of these artists' livelihoods and uh, they, you know, they don't know what's good half the time, but it's just, you know, it's this job where, you know, they don't have a, uh, they basically, you know, they could be right or wrong and we would never know. Dude, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, we were talking a little bit about the Rogan podcast. I listened to a couple hours of post Malone kind of mm -hmm. like talking shit. And he was like, he was just talking about how like he just walked into the studio one day and wrote what is better now or mm -hmm. some of these like, just like hit songs. Yeah. And uh, it's like, it just kind of like comes out of nowhere almost. Like well, he's also just like on another way when he's writing shit too. Like he's always just on mushrooms yeah. and like six beers deep, probably yeah. more like I, sh I could not do that. So what is your kind of like, not to creative process, but like, how do you get your mindset in the right zone? Cause I've been thinking a lot about, you know, you don't want to try and be creative when your brain wants to be resting yeah. or like, like how do you kind of balance like your mind state with what you're doing? You know, it's, it's hard and I'm, it's changing all the time. I think the number one thing for me is having a space that I'm comfortable creating in. Mm. Um, cause a, a lot of the time, well, so when I first moved to LA and like I first started like doing a bunch of sessions with artists, I would, uh, I would go into these studios that felt that, you know, they're really high end studios, but they felt kind of sterile. And like, I didn't know how a lot of the equipment worked cause mm -hmm. it wasn't familiar to me. And, uh, it just never really felt like a vibe, you know? And, uh, I think the past couple of years of my success can be largely attributed to just having like a home studio that I really know and love and like nice. just making it a place that's like not comfortable for me only, but also comfortable for people that I bring over, you know, like nice, like this room right here, man. Exactly. Like Hopefully this, you're this a little is comfortable. a cool little room. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just move some furniture around. <laughs> that's all it takes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But like, it's, it's really just like, you know, and part of being a producer is like, how do I get the best song possible out of this artist? You know, it's not necessarily just about like making music. It's like, mm -hmm. how do I get the best music out of them? 
and I think a lot of that is like making them comfortable and, you know, making yourself comfortable too. So you guys are like in a space to create something that's cool, you know? I love it. Yeah. Man, but it really depends that's a on talent the, in itself too. Yeah. Like what percentage, I guess you can't put a percentage, but like I see producing as almost like management in business. Like you can't just have one skill. You have to understand the languages of the artist. Cause like artists can be kind of hit or miss, you know, sometimes they're feeling it. Sometimes they're not. Well, artists are a hundred percent of them are just like really fucking weird. <laughs> and you have this extremely broad spectrum of people, you know? Uh -huh. So it's like, you have to wear a lot of different hats. You have to be able to navigate a bunch of different personalities. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a way that I haven't found in another profession, but I think that's something that I'm pretty good at. Um, and you know, that almost comes first before even being good at being a pr like making music. You Interesting. know, it's like, yeah. What's kind of like a lesson that well, maybe like a, a challenge that you've had in that space? Cause I'm sure it's not all, you know, biscuits and gravy. As yeah. My one buddy said, but like when you, when you do like butt heads with somebody, like what does that process look like? Um, there's never been anything where, you know, no one's ever just like, like a flat out dick or anything, but I think probably the most out of my element I've been is when I did a, uh, I did a, I went to Atlanta for a week to, uh, work with a bunch of like hip hop artists out there. And that was just like, like stuff just works differently out there. And it was like, it was this thing called a writing camp, which is where like a label will like rent out an entire studio and they'll get a bunch of artists together with a bunch of producers and songwriters and like mm -hmm. basically just make as many songs as you can in this week. And it's a very like LA thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't know that at the time. I, I just thought that happened kind of everywhere, but in Atlanta, it's like, mostly like people just working with their homies you know it's mm -hmm. like they have a producer that they've known for a long time and like they'll bring all their friends mm -hmm. and like so flying out for a week and trying to collab exactly they don't sense. they don't yeah. do like you know the cold meat a lot of times you know like mm -hmm. they're they're not used to working with like people that they don't know very well mm -hmm. and uh and you know i'm just like this like suburban white kid from la <laughs> that's like i would go to this like you know like this sketchy area in atlanta and work with a bunch of like street rappers and it mm -hmm. was like it was dope and I'm like huge fans of all the people that I worked with, but it was just like, I felt a little bit out of my element, you know? And it ended up being, I had one really bad session where there was just like this dude that like brought like 30 of his homies to the studio and like everyone was being loud. Like oh, I was trying man. to make a beat and it was just like, damn, it was just brutal. But <laughs> there were, there were a couple that were like pretty cool. Nice. Well, yeah, yeah, those like shitty moments, obviously you grow through them probably more totally. than like the average day at the office. Well, you also like you learn what you like doing and what you don't like doing too, you know? And it's mm -hmm. like, I'm lucky to be at a place now where like, I don't have to grind and take every session as much as I used to when, when, uh, um, I first started producing. And like, I, one of the other things that I've learned too is like my favorite thing and the most successful thing for me has been like not seeking out the biggest artists, but like working with my friends who I like working with yeah and just growing with people that are at your level you know dude i have that same mindset like a lot of people who start podcasts they just want to get the biggest guest possible yeah. and i'm like man the only bar for being on this podcast is that you're passionate about what you do because yeah. like we're in our mid-20s and like in 10 years from now there's a lot of these other people in their mid-20s that are going to be further along in their career i want to grow with those people rather 100%. than try and get on the coattails of the something 40 and 50 somethings that are kind of on their way out there yeah not as hungry, you know, but they kind of expect the same level of success a lot of the time. And I don't know if that's how it is in the music industry, but hundred um, percent. I had a horrible experience working with a 48, 50 year old director last year. And it's oh, like, really? man, it was just like, I don't want to go into it too much, but learned a lot about not working with people that you can't trust for sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just like, then I made my own film and I've learned way more through just like doing my own thing. Yeah. And, um, for sure. Yeah. There's especially like if you and your friends all blow up, like there's a lot more to be said about that than just like, you know, finding, you know, someone that's already really established and just kind of like riding their coattails, you know, mm -hmm. you have like much more longevity and, and growing yourself, you know? Yeah. And I mean, talking to you just for whatever, half an hour so far, like it's clear that like blowing up and like gaining like notoriety is not like going to basically it's not really what you're looking for as an end. It's no. like you, you speak to that a little bit more, but like you, on one hand, like you're, you're motivated by the fact that it could like some of your songs could blow up and mm -hmm. it's a like for sure feels good. I'm sure yeah. when someone you get a bunch of views or listens or whatever, but at the same time, like a true artist just does the art with no, they don't really listen to the haters. They don't listen to the, to the supporters that yeah. much. But. I think you need to find a good balance of both. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, 
there's in the music industry, there's so many people that like, so, especially within like the songwriting community that, you know, they're like, I want to write Selena Gomez next hit. Like, let's, let's write her. They'll just, you know, they shoot for like the biggest artist possible or who they have no connection to at all. And mm -hmm. like, they just think that they're going to get, you know, they're, they think they're going to get a song to Post Malone or someone and it's mm -hmm. just never going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, you also need to like be business minded in like some sense and be like, all right, well, there's going to be people listening to this at some point, you know, like, mm -hmm. how do we make this, how do we give this song the best chance for success? Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I definitely fell into that trap. Like when I first moved to LA, I was like, oh, I'm going to make like big pop songs. That's what I want to do. And then I was like, I'm not even like good at making pop music. I don't like pop, like straight, like female pop vocals. That's mm -hmm. like not for me. Like I'm going to like do what I'm good at, which is like, you know, kind of like the more left leaning pop stuff and like hip hop stuff. And, uh, and just like really hone in on that, even if nice. it's not like the most popping thing, which I guess now it kind of is like hip hop is basically pop, but, uh, hmm. but yeah. So what's kind of like been a big shift for you recently and like, where are you putting your energy now for like the type of stuff? Like you said, you were 20 minutes late here. You're only 10 minutes late, <laughs> but, uh, you're working today, you know? Yeah. And, uh, what are you well, working Well, it's on? been interesting with quarantine because, you know, my, my schedule, uh, before quarantine would be, I would, you know, wake up, have coffee, you know, answer a couple emails if I need to just kind of chill for like the first, like two, three hours of my day. And then at usually at 12 or one, I'll have a, a session, um, like Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll write a song with whoever I'm working with that day for, you know, six or seven hours. Actually, it's usually quicker. It's like five or six hours. Mm -hmm. Um, and then come home and eat dinner and do the same thing. Uh, but obviously now no one's like working in rooms together for the most part. Um, so I started doing like zoom sessions, zoom writing sessions at first. And no shit. It actually, you can function that way. Not really. I don't, <laughs> I've done a couple and like uh -huh. the songs have been cool, but it's just like never a vibe, you uh -huh, know, like uh -huh. it's, there's just something about like capturing like a vibe in the room. That's like so important to like all be together rather like than over zoom where, you know, you have to like mute yourself to like do something or like the artist will be like, all right, I'm going to record. I'll call you guys back in like 10 minutes. Huh. And it's just like way less of a vibe. But, um, but now my, my workflow over the past few months, I've, I've just been doing random shit. Like people will send me, uh, like today I was working on, uh, this dude, young gravy, who's, uh, like a rapper from the Midwest. He, he sent me like a couple of acapellas that uh that he just like recorded over i think they were just like some youtube beat or something nice. and he just sent me the acapella he's like yo can you just like reproduce the beat for this and i'm like yeah sure i'm down and it's so like, he has like the youtube version you just you basically he didn't even send me the beat he would just send me the acapella and he's like yo can you just build a beat oh, like wow. around this and uh it was just i mean it's honestly easier for me most of the time to build that so you um, have some constraints but not like too many you can kind of go different directions with exactly the music yeah. instruments and stuff yeah that you use. That's yeah cool. and a lot of people will be sending me like demos that they just did like them and like uh piano and vocals and mm -hmm. they'll be like yo can you produce this out like make this a whole song and I'll be like yeah absolutely dude that's um, awesome which is cool because i can you know i can crank out like two a day sometimes if i'm motivated uh -huh. um whereas like and most of the time when they're sending me those songs their songs that they like and their songs that they're like ready to release, you know, whereas mm -hmm. like in a writing session, you're making something that may or may not be cool. Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a shot in the dark, but you know, people are just sending me stuff left and right that they already like and that mm -hmm. I can uh, produce out and that are good to go. You know, that's interesting. I'm learning right now about just how this whole music industry works. Like I, you know, with a film, it's like, there's stages to it. And yeah, it's pretty just, linear with a film. Huh? And it's like, it takes a lot of time, yeah. but it sounds like with song, like you can come to the session, start with like a beat and build on top of it and yeah. you can have a song at the end of the day. It's different every time. I mean, it's, it, people have no idea what the best way to write a song is, you know? Yeah. I mean, so it used to take months to write a song. And like, I used to, one of the biggest things for me uh, before I moved to LA uh, was that I used to spend like a month or two on one song and like, I would be able to make like 10 songs a year. And now in LA, I'll write a song a day hmm. um, and just like crank it out. And just because you need that output to be able to have a career out of it, you know, and it kind of yeah. got me out of my own head a little bit, which is cool. Yeah. Where do you see like music playing a bigger role in like right now? Obviously, it's a hot topic. There's a ton of like unrest, you know, there's like social unrest, I guess you yeah. could say. Like, how does music bring people together or like tell a story or like where do you see even your own music like? impacting people in some form well i think the way that people listen to music is changing really fast especially with things like 
quarantine um, and well, TikTok's another good example. I mean, mm. TikTok in the last six months has basically changed the way that people write songs. Because, really? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, if you look at what TikTok is, it's basically 15 seconds of a song that you're, you know, and people are making songs specifically for that. And that's crazy to, to like make dances to. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean like that Drake two C slide song. Have you heard that? No, I don't think so. I'm not really, really like, on TikTok, honestly. It's basically like uh it's like the hokey pokey, but like okay. interpolated into like a Drake song. And uh, he, I guarantee he released that specifically because he knew it would be like a TikTok dance. So like, hmm. d- like TikTok dances are a huge thing on TikTok. Yeah, and like, I, I've seen that. And songs it's, it's just a songs blow outside, up because yeah. of them. Like it, insane amount. Like I, I did this song. Is it, do you, are you familiar with Cody Ko and Noel Miller at all? They're like, they're two YouTube guys, and uh, I produce a lot of their music. And uh, we did a song and put it out, and it did okay for like six months, and then just randomly blew up on TikTok and it's got like almost 60 million streams on Holy Spotify crap. now just like out of nowhere from and almost all of them are from TikTok and and uh and we owned that song completely too there was no label involved either so like all the money just flowed directly to us dude that's awesome yeah so i mean and and you see something like that it changed my mind too you know yeah. i don't want to write songs for TikTok but yeah. there's definitely been times i've been like making music where i'm like oh we should put this in because like uh-huh. this would work well for TikTok, you know? Wow, it's it's uh man, that's really interesting. Like it's really weird. It's this industry, the industry has shifted so much. Yeah, I remember in business school they talk about like the, just from the CD to or from like the record to the CD mm-hmm. to the MP3 to streaming. Yeah, there's been like this arc of uh, just like the the change in the format of how the music is shared, yeah. how it's distributed, how the money flows. Mm-hmm. Like, well, it's so dynamic and it's it's so confusing to everyone too. It's like literally designed to confuse people that are uh, that are creatives, you know. And mm-hmm. it's and it sucks that it's like that, but it's just it's it changes so quickly. And you know, I'm sure film is the same way. Um, but it's like Netflix, for example. There's films that like have a huge budget. They go on Netflix, and maybe Netflix just like takes it off their platform, but they have the rights to it. And yeah. So it's just like you you put in years to this like sweet documentary film, and now it's just on the shelf somewhere at Netflix headquarters. Yeah. And no one's ever going to see it. Yeah, I believe it. That's pretty. It, there's some crazy stuff, and I've heard like with Rogan's podcast going to Spotify. I read an article about how the number of cents per listen that people get, like the average artist on spotify makes like almost nothing per listen Mm -hmm. whereas back when there was cds out like you would sell a cd and you would make hard cash on every sale yeah so it's like well it's different though because i mean the overhead is so high on like producing cds mm -hmm. and shipping them out and designing the packaging i mean there's so much involved whereas spotify you just hit upload and you're basically just getting free money in your pocket right and you know there's a big um, there's a big movement in the music community right now to get Spotify to pay more for streams. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, I think it's about uh, $4,500 per million streams, <coughs> which is, for the average artist, it's not sustainable. That's not, yeah. Um, but, you know, what, the thing I like about being a producer is, like, I can crank out songs and put out a bunch of songs and I have a cap like a catalog of music that's basically just earning money in perpetuity mm-hmm. just from streams. So that's kind of cool, you know, cool. cause it's like a revenue stream that never really dies. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, when you're an artist and like starting out you don't have much music, it sucks. Mm-hmm. Do you, can you, um, like if let's say someone wants to listen to songs that you've produced, like mm-hmm. where would you point them to? Can you search your name on Spotify or, um, Yes, uh, I have a playlist, but I've made it private because some songs on there are, are not public knowledge that I've produced them. Okay. I, you're probably not familiar with ghost producing, are you? Uh, so I, not really. Explain it. Especially in electronic music, there it's kind of a it has a little bit of a stigma. Um, it's basically when a DJ will hire a producer to just like make a full song for him. And it's, uh, they'll usually just pay like a lump sum of money and then you'll get royalties on the back end, but like no credit anywhere. Hmm. And it's just like completely like under the radar. Hmm. Um, and that's like kind of what I came up doing. Hmm. And so there's a lot of stuff out there that like, I'm not, my name is not attached to it all. And that stuff's harder to find. Dude. But, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to find some of those songs. <laughs> I, I have a, I have a playlist of, of everything that I've produced on Spotify. Can I get the private, private. playlist? I'll, I'll send it to you sweet, by the time man. this comes out. Yeah. That'd be sweet. Yeah. I would, uh, yeah. I'd love to put like a song that you have the rights to at the end of this podcast or something. Yeah. yeah totally. If, if there is one. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can definitely give you a license. Yeah. I love, uh, incorporating. I've done it twice. I've had two other music related podcasts. And, With who? Um, well, my one buddy's a rapper here in Seattle. JP Palapal is his rapper name. He's nice. a 
full-time accountant at EY. Oh, really? And uh, it was actually funny. I'll have to show you the music video. I shot a music video with them. One morning, we just like basically got a conference room at the school at Seattle University. Uh-huh. Just him and a bunch of buddies uh, just brought their laptops. We were all sitting there. It's called Busy, St- Busy Season Freestyle, kind uh-huh. of like talking about how he produced this song during the busy season of tax season, just kind of like about the commitment to the craft. And that's funny. at the end of the video, everyone's throwing chairs around the table and I'm sitting there holding the camera in the corner of the room, trying not to get hit by a chair. <laughs> so it was pretty, it was pretty fun. That's but, cool. uh, yeah. Him. And then my other friend, um, Johnny Vanderbilt, and I mentioned who's an nice. electronic music uh, producer and yeah, his stuff is super cool. And he started kind of the same way, similar way of just like, started as a DJ and then realized that he could do some producing and stuff. Mm-hmm. So man, what, what words would you give to someone who's like passionate about it, but they don't really see it as a viable path? Like what advice would you give early on? I think if, I don't know, it's hard to say. Cause I mean, if you don't see it as a viable path, it might not be for you. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, you kind of have to like go all in on it. Um, really? And, uh, but also at the same time, it's like, don't look at what other people have done and expect that to be your path. You know, everyone's right. path is completely different. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is just to like follow your own path, you know? Mm -hmm. And cause I, you know, we were, I think we were talking about this before the podcast about just how like we grew up in an area where everyone is kind of expected to do the same thing and go to a four year college. And like, I had this idea in my head that was like, Oh, I don't want to like, I can't just like be the broke music guy, you know, (laughs) like all my friends are going to like have dope jobs and like Uh be like making a bunch of money and, you know, doing dope things. And the reality of it is like all my friends are working jobs and now, and they're still broke (laughs) and I'm doing fuck all and like, you know, like living it up. And so, uh, yeah, I I don't know. I, I just, you know, everyone has their own path and it's different for everyone. And I, I don't think anyone would look down on you if you're, if you're, you know, broke, just like making music, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, the, for sure. So a pattern that I've seen is there are a million paths. And like, if you think you're going to go the same path as somebody else, like forget about that. But, yeah. um, for me, I had a professor my last year in college who was like, you're clearly passionate about this. Cause I was always like the business minded, like I'm going to be, I'm going to go to consulting and then kind of follow that path and maybe start my own business one day. And he's like, no, like you should think about this as a viable path. Yeah. That one guy, Olivia Morel, my professor completely shifted my mindset towards the fact that I could like take steps in this direction. I I just share that like with anyone who asks me, because there's so many people that are passionate about something, whether it's music or film or drawing or whatever it is. And with the internet now specifically, like I don't know what the word is like democratization of information and just like you can get out there, yeah. but there's like a lot of humps and challenges and like, totally. Like, Everything's a learning process. There's nothing. I yeah. mean, did you learn anything in business school that was really like directly applicable to like what you're doing now? It's <sighs> a good question. Very little. I, I said it the other day. I learned more from listening to podcasts than I ever learned in school. And yeah. I'm not even exaggerating. Like, yeah, my parents, fortunately paid for me to go to college. I didn't take on a bunch of debt, but there are people who go get out of business school with very few hard skills with hundred thousand or more dollars in debt. Oh, totally. Yeah. And then like the chance of being an artist is like none. Cause yeah. now you're just paying off the bills until you're 35, which yeah. is, which is brutal. So yeah, it's, it's tough when you're in that like 18 to 21 year old phase and like you have to make these big decisions about your future. Yeah. And, uh, I think I would have been a different person had I not gone to college and, you know, I, I didn't learn a ton from college necessarily that's Mm -hmm. like applicable to what I do now, but I think had I gone full force into music when I was 18 and graduated high school, I probably would have burned out and not Mm -hmm. really done much. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Dude, I'm so thankful for my path. And I didn't even tell you this, but I got kicked out of college. Oh, really? Six weeks before. Where did you go to school? I went to Notre Dame. Oh, okay, nice. I got six uh, six weeks before I was going to graduate. I got kicked out of college. And dude, I shipped a package of weed in the mail to myself. (laughs) And I'll tell you, man, like in the moment it was horrible, but I actually knew that it was an opportunity to grow. And that moment basically like put me on a path to take the step in the direction of being an artist and being a creator that I maybe never would have taken. And totally. I would find myself like last year, I went to Nepal for a month and just, just hiked in the mountains. Mm-hmm. And I was, man, I was up there and just like having these moments of bliss where I was looking back on my life and realizing like your life literally can go so many different ways and your, your path. If you don't take control, like be the person who's driving that path, someone else is going to push you in another direction or totally. society or whatever you want to say. And, 
you might end up like, you know, 40, 50 years old, like regretting life, which is to me the biggest fear that I have. Yeah. I think I, it's important to be cognizant too. It's, I mean, it's important to have your own path, but I think it's also important to not follow that path directly sometimes. Cause there, I mean, there's so many times that like I've thought in my head, like where I'm going to be and mm -hmm. like my life has just taken me somewhere else. That's like better. And it's like, you know, it's important to realize when you're at the fork in the road, like which path to take, you know, how do you do that? Like what, what, where's kind of your barometer, if you will, like, it's hard to say. How are I mean, you I've, open to receiving like what life has for you? Exactly. It's yeah. like, you know, it, it, be open to, to doing stuff that's like not originally like what you like. I mean, I guess for me, like, like I was saying, I always wanted to be like in a band, you know, like performing in front of a bunch of people. And like that just never really happened for me career wise. And had I not like, I, I basically, you know, had some production opportunities fall in my lap and had I not capitalized on those and really mm -hmm. gone in full force, I probably wouldn't have the career in music that I do now. That's really um, interesting. You'd be living in some van with your dad, following your dad around. Exactly. Which <laughs> might be <laughs> tight, but, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's really important to like put yourself in a bunch of different places and, uh, and then just like really put all your eggs into what works, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and just like, you know, find that balance between what you love and, and what is going to keep you, um, happy and, and stable, you know? Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about, um, kind of to change subjects a bit and go backwards. What time is it by the way? And how much time do, do you have? 220. I'm, uh, I'm going flying it at three. So I got probably 15 more minutes. Let's, let's do it, man. Perfect. Yeah, this is perfect. Um, this has been awesome by the way. Nice. I'm yeah, yeah. loving this conversation. Um, I want to hear a little bit about, like, I see a lot of, I mean, I don't know much about the music industry, but like, basically, there's people that are at the top of this industry that almost it sounds like take advantage of people in the lower, like, yeah, young and hungry people like yourself. Like, how did you avoid that? And like, what kind of pitfalls did you fall into? Like, have people taken advantage of you in certain ways? Like, yeah. Um, I, it's, it's, you know, it's really hard to say. Um, and I think the music industry, it gets a bad rap because, um, there are people that are hungry, but I mean, it's really just the institution of the music industry itself that makes people like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of designed to screw artists over and the whole record label model is really built on, uh, profiting off of right it's people. like you sign your name on that sheet and you think oh i'm gonna get a million dollars and then all of a sudden your music is making hundreds of millions of yeah. dollars and that none of that money is going to you yeah. or a small percentage of it well it's, it's really hard nowadays because with streaming labels are making uh way less money so they mm -hmm. need to take a bigger portion of what the artist is making to even stay in business but what a record label does nowadays is pretty questionable at best i mean basically the general school of thought is that the record label is basically a bank for artists. Now it's like you get a loan mm -hmm. and, uh, from the record label, that's your advance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you have to pay that back with the money that your music makes. Mm. Um, and that's uh, sketchy and you don't receive any money until that loan is completely paid back. Um, and that's pretty much, that's 98% of what the record labels do nowadays is just mm. give you money. Um, and, for that money, they impose a lot of restrictions and here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. Yeah. And, and it really sucks. And have you seen uh, a, st a star is born? What's it called? I haven't. No, dude, I've watched it. This is a confession in the theaters with my family. Mm -hmm. And you just see like from at least from that perspective, like how someone can kind of their artist, they, them as an artist can be really influenced to go a certain direction. Yeah, like, totally. You see this like, She's singing, uh, Lady Gaga is singing in a bar and she's got so much like authenticity and what mm -hmm. she's, you just see it. And then all of a sudden she's like dancing with less clothes on and like making yeah. beats a certain way. And it's funny that actually, I think that happens less nowadays uh -huh. because of the way that, that streaming works rather than, cause I think, you know, back in the day labels would, they would put a lot of money into one artist and they would have a huge control over what the artist's image is, mm -hmm. all this stuff. Nowadays, they're kind of just investing in artists individually and, you know, they're saying here, we'll put, we'll give you, you know, a couple hundred thousand bucks here as an advance and we'll, we'll do this for like a hundred other artists and we'll just see which one pops and then it's we'll put like more venture money capital, that, you know, you know? It's, it's exactly like, like let's that. just make a bunch it of couldn't be more similar. Yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. But yeah, I mean, I, the vast majority of people that I've worked with in, in the industry are really good people, but I think it's because I've made a point to intentionally surround myself with those people. Um, but you know, it sucks. Like I. I I'm signed to uh, a publishing deal and a record label deal. And 
I really like the people that I work with for the most part at the label. Mm -hmm. But um, there's times where they're like, oh yeah, you can't do this. It's in your contract. And I'm mm -hmm. like, why? Like, why? For is how like much this? longer? Like, uh, not too long. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'm in a publishing deal for, so publishing is basically, it's like a record deal for songwriters. So it's, okay. uh, it's just on publishing royalties, which is like a specific type of royalty. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm on a, I have a publishing deal for, I think three more years. And then I have a record deal for 10 more songs. Okay. Um, okay. so yeah, they're just two independent deals of each other and they're at different record labels. Or at the they're same? with the same label, uh -huh. but well, they're with the same parent company. There's okay. like a publishing label and then there's a record label. It's, it's just confusing and designed to confuse yeah, people like me. It, it's confusing me. That's yeah. for sure. So it's, yeah, there's a, there's a really good documentary. Uh, do you know like Jared Leto, the actor yes. and like his band 30 seconds to Mars? Yes. Um, they did a documentary on, it was supposed to be on the making of their third album, I think. And three days into the filming of it, they got sued for $30 million by EMI, which is their record label. And it basically, the documentary kind of follows the whole lawsuit and uh, how the music industry is just like this antiquated system that's designed to uh, take advantage of artists. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, they have the best managers in the game, the best lawyers in the game, and, you mm -hmm. know, they're smart guys and they've still been, you know, trapped into this really shitty deal. Mm. Um, but like for anyone that doesn't know, I mean, I watched that like two years ago having been in the music industry for a little bit and I learned so much from it. And, you know, it's for anyone that doesn't know a lot about the music industry or just like wants to know how things work. It's, it's such a great documentary. What's it called actually? Sorry. I think it's I'm called, sure. it's called this is war, I think, or maybe that's the name of the album. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's I'm sure one you can of the find it. Documentary, Jared Leto Jared Leto. documentaries. Yeah. yeah. Huh? Yeah. He was on the chase Jarvis live podcast. Actually. I edited What's his that? podcast. It's the podcast I edit. Actually. Oh, okay. Um, didn't tell He's you. He's an that. interesting guy. Who is Jared, Jared Leto? Leto? Yeah, yeah. He um he had a lot of good stuff to say for sure. Kind of a, a, eclectic a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, yeah I had a phone call with him once, and it was pretty intimidating. He was a strange oh, guy. Shit, <laughs> dude. I, do do you like uh, ever get nervous like around working with big artists and stuff like that? I did for sure uh -huh. uh, when I when I like first uh, started doing that stuff. Um, but then I realized that I like artists, everyone's like so similar, you know, everyone's going through the same shit. Like mm -hmm. no, everyone's, you know, pretty chill for the most part. And no one, no one really has like huge egos. Um, and if they do, they're not like a dick about it, you know, like I guess plenty of artists have like egos, but they're not like, you know, it's, it's, it's always pretty chill. Yeah. That's, that's good to hear for sure. Yeah. Man, I've learned so much about the music industry just by talking to you. <laughs> I like, could talk about the music industry for a long time. For it's sure. something that I hate and I know a lot about, so I'm pretty passionate about it. Dude, I'm, uh, I'm just curious and I, you know, I can tell your passion is like just radiating around this room right now. So, <laughs> uh, man, I just want to. I guess start to wrap it up, but appreciate you uh, coming on. We're coming up to an hour here. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Time for having flies, me. Bro. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was, uh, the pleasure was all mine. Shout out to Matthew Callens for introducing Shout us. Out indeed. And I don't know how many more of these, uh, in-person ones I'm going to be doing in the near future. I'm going to Mexico for a couple months. Oh yeah. Uh, no one, no one's going to be in Mexico. <laughs> I'll, be on, I'll be on zoom, but, uh, where can I like stay up to date with your stuff and like, what's your social handle? Um, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty dark on the internet. Honestly, I Are don't you? post like a lot of about like just what I'm working doing on the craft. Huh? Um, no, I mean like I just, you know, most of like, most of my Instagram posts is like not like what I'm working on music wise. Like I just, what happened to the Tesla, man? Why were you driving a Mercedes? That's, or, uh, that's my dad's car. The oh, Tesla's in California. Okay, okay. I was going to say, um, <laughs> yeah, it's still down there. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll send you, a, I'll send you a playlist of all the stuff I produce, but I mean, Sweet. my, my Instagram is at diamond pistols. My Twitter yeah. is at diamond pistols. Um, but, uh, yeah, dude, hell yeah, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Appreciate thanks for having me, yeah. bro. Appreciate it. Appreciate you.